So here we gather, a new Sabbath has dawned. But today is even more special because today we mark as Peace Sabbath, a day in which we remember the valor, the sacrifice of our men and women who have served this country, oftentimes with their very lives. So today we also not only are asked to remember and to reflect, but also to think about how we move forward as a people, as a country, as a nation. So let us begin with our opening hymn, Let Us Build a House. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, one and all, whether you are gathered here in this place as a family or online in our virtual community. Welcome, one and all, to Barhaven United Church. It just amazes me. You know, each and every Sunday I look out and I see all, well, half of your face. And uh, it's just wonderful, you know? It'll be amazing when we can actually see your whole face. But that's okay, you know? We'll take what we can get. And, uh, and this is wonderful. So this is indeed wonderful that we can gather on this day. I also just want to mention that today will be the first Sunday that, not that our choir is back, but that they will be singing an anthem. And we're very excited. <clears throat> Music is such an important part of our, of our faith and of our expression of our faith. So it's so wonderful that we were able to do this in a, in a, safe, um, a safe way for all. So before we move deeper into our worship service today, I have two announcements. The one, the information is in life and work. And this is concerning the memorial service for Stuart Grant. But just in case you perhaps didn't see it, um, the funeral will be held for him at the parish of St. John's Anglican Church this Tuesday at 9 a.m. And the one thing that isn't in life and work is that it says, following COVID protocol, the family has requested that the attendance be available to fully vaccinated guests and please wear a mask. 
And there, from what I recall, there will also be a reception after the service for Stuart. The other announcement is one from Outreach that Liz has sent me and asked me to share it with all of you today. So I'm going to read it. A couple weeks ago, we thanked our Outreach Ministry volunteers in the life and work for their commitment and contributions. This ministry is a key part of our congregational life and living out our faith. After several months of soul searching, the Outreach Coordinating Team has stepped down. Also, during the next year, BUC will be working out together how we will move forward on the visioning process or the visioning focus on social justice themes and the traditional outreach activities that have helped to define us at BUC. Over this next year, the leadership of some outreach activities will continue, but there is a need for people to step up to guide a few of the traditional activities that support our key partners. Four volunteers are needed, one for each of the following. One, a liaison for multi-faith housing initiative. Two, a liaison for the three community chaplaincies. Three, one for mission and service within the United Church of Canada. And lastly, a person to provide some oversight of BUC's outreach donations. Information and support will be provided. Please see Life and Work for more details. And lastly, thank you for considering this way to contribute to the life of BUC. So here we gather with memories, with thoughts, with prayers, with so much on our hearts. But know that you are not alone. Wherever you may find yourselves, wherever you may be, we are together on this journey. So let's take a few moments of silence to be present to the spirit that works in us, amongst us, and around us. Friends, let us begin. We sing of God the Spirit, faithful and untamable, who is creatively and redemptively active in the world. the aid of God's Spirit. <clears throat> Who are we gathered in this place? And what is this shalom? Why are we here? Then come, let us gather. Let us worship the Holy One and let us prepare ourselves to carry God's peace into God's world. Let us pray. Remembering, remember the suffering of the world. Remembering the sacrifice of soldiers, civilians, and peacemakers. Remember the Holy Spirit who leads us into the ways of peace and light. As we move into our time of remembrance, I invite you to please stand in body or in spirit.
In Flanders Fields by John McCrae. In Flanders Fields the poppies blow, between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from falling hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. And now the act of remembrance. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them.
Open wide our hearts. Open wide our minds. Open your word to us this morning, we pray. Let your holy light shine upon it and through it, bringing us light and life. Amen. Amen. Our first reading is taken from the epistle of Hebrews, chapter 9, verses 24 to 28. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself again and again as the high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood that is not his own. For then he would have had to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once, and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting him. Our second reading is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 12, verses 38 to 44. As he taught, he said, Beware of the scribes, who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces, and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearance, they say long prayers. They will receive a greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. May God's wisdom bless our understanding of the word. With wisdom's help, may it be so. I invite you, let us pray. Loving God, we pray that you will open our ears, our ears and our hearts to hear your wisdom, our minds to be open to receive it, and our hands and feet ready to share your wisdom with others. With Christ as our companion and guide, we pray. Amen. In one of my fourth year, which is the final year at theological school, in one of those classes, those small groups that we always have, the learning groups and sharing groups, we were asked one day, what was one of the challenges that, that was coming up for us or one of the challenges that we thought that we might face in our first year of ministry? And one student brought up and he could tell he had a heavy heart or sort of a conflicted heart. And he was saying that one of the things that was really challenging him was the upcoming Remembrance Day service that he was asked to lead in the church he was serving. But you know, I think that if you would conduct a survey of many mainline Protestant ministers about what special days during the church calendar that they find the most difficult to preach on, I'm sure that many of them would have Remembrance Day in their top three. And this should really come as no surprise. Because I think if you, even if you surveyed all the people here this morning, I'm sure that there are many differing opinions 
about, about what we're doing here right now too. But even when it comes to how the church broaches the topic of war there as well has been many perspectives. Over the centuries within the church there have been those who have used war to further their religious dogma. War has been used to expand the coffers of the church and to gain converts. More recently, in the last couple decades, the church has done a lot of soul searching by looking at what could be considered a just war. Now at the other end of the spectrum, there are also those known as pacifists, those that believe that there's no such thing as a just war regardless of the issues at stake. When I was doing my theological education placement in Kingston, I had the opportunity to study with a man who was the minister of a large downtown church, one that sort of bordered right on, right on the, the border of, of Queen's University. Now within this congregation there were professors, the current speaker of the house at the time, retired ministers and military personnel. And as Remembrance Day approached, I asked him how he broached the topic of Remembrance Day and war. And I'll never forget, he just sort of sat there and he looked off into the distance and he said, very, very carefully. The world at times is not a very peaceful place. And even when we look at our scriptures, the, the Bible passages on war are not black and white or definitive or one way or the other. When it comes to war and violence, the Bible, like on many other topics, seems to be full, filled with contradictions. In the Old Testament, the pages ring out with a God who, who wants the Israelites to engage in preemptive war, while the New Testament has God saying through Jesus to turn the other cheek. When it comes to violence and war, there doesn't seem to be a simple answer. So maybe when the area is gray and the way uncertain, we are better served to come at an issue from a different angle. To focus on the men and women who have given their youth, their physical and mental health, and oftentimes their very lives, to defend those who could not defend themselves. It is through the sacrifice and compassion and love that our peacemakers, our peacekeepers, and military personnel have that it is through that that we can catch a glimpse, just a bit, of the sacrifice and of the love that Jesus has for us. So on this Remembrance Day, I would like to share with you two letters that, that, uh, that you too can read. And there's on this website, it's called the Canadian Letters and Images Project. There are hundreds, if not thousands of letters that soldiers and the people that they cared about back home wrote during the First and Second World War. Now, two letters that I've chosen to share with you today, one comes from World War I and the other from World War II, and it's soldiers writing home to their families. They were young, perhaps aware of the danger around them, but oftentimes more worried about the loved ones that they had left at home, the people that, that were at the very heart of why they were far away from home fighting a battle that they can only hope to win. Now the first letter that I would like to read for you is from Lieutenant Harvey Simeon Bernard, who was from Theodore, Saskatchewan. And Bernard served overseas with the South Saskatchewan Regiment, RCIC. And it begins like this. Somewhere in France, 21st July, 44. Dear folks, well it's Sunday, so here goes another note. I'm with the unit now in an arrest area. The reason is that they ran into a little trouble up front and I had to come back and get reorganized. When I wrote my last letter, the report came back that only two men had been wounded, but they run into some German tanks a few minutes later and things went bad. The infantry they run into were dead scared of Canadians and they could hardly wait to surrender. But the tanks were a different story and it won't happen again. At present, we're living in ex-German billets, which are very much like our own back in England, 
except that they have them very well hidden. They're very clean and comfortable after sleeping in slit trenches. The country here is very nice. It's a little warmer than England, but damper and more mosquitoes, but not enough to bother you sleeping without protection. It rained for almost 24 hours here the day the unit went in. And what with crawling and being drowned out of slit trenches, they were quite a mess. But we'll soon be ready again, and I feel sorry for the tank crews of the SSRs that we meet in the future. Things look darn good at the present. And if we can only catch those tanks with ours, we'll soon be in Paris. In fact, I've started a mustache that I intend to let grow until we get to Paris. It isn't much yet, but I think with a little nursing, it will develop into something. How has the hay crop been? I just received Ian and May's letters, and I was glad to hear things were going okay. It seems like 20 acres of hay laying cut still breaks the weather. Well, can't think of anything more. At present, I have three tins, three pins that work and three watches that keep time, so can't complain. Hope you're all well. Yours truly, Harvey B. Four days after this letter was written, Lieutenant Bernard was killed at the age of 35 in France. The second letter is from Jordan J. Morissette, who was born in the eastern townships of Quebec near Minton in 1895. He attended elementary school in North Hatley, where he first met Marjorie Reed, who was the recipient of these letters. While attending McGill University, he enlisted May 1st, 1916, with a siege battery raised by the principal of McGill, Sir William Peterson, which eventually became the seventh Canadian siege battery overseas. And this is how this letter begins. Belgium, November 10th, 1917. Dear Marjorie, I do not know whether you've been looking for a letter from me or not. Anyway, I will write once more in hopes of getting a reply sometime. I look from letters from you in every Canadian mail, but have been unsuccessful for some time past. Do you know that the last word I had from you was a, a note added on to the one of Ella's while up on the lake? Please write at least once in a while, Marjorie if for nothing more than to tell me the news. This is an awful place up here. The Canadians have been in bad places, but this beats them all. The mud and weather conditions themselves are enough to make a mortal crazy to say nothing of other things. I cannot say how much you will, how much, but we'll all be glad to get out of here. That is the least I can say. Any, of the, any other part of the line would almost seem like heaven. I want to ask you a question, Marjorie. Now, please don't think me presumptuous in taking the liberty of doing so. But if you ever fall in love yourself, will you let me know? I ask you this because you asked that we would be good friends, but don't answer me unless you care to. I suppose you're very busy with your school. The Christmas holidays and exams will soon be here, will they not? Remember, remember me to Miss Bryant. I wish I was back in her school again. I'm afraid that this letter is not very cheerful. The surroundings are far from such. However, I feel that I could be a good deal worse off. So why not be cheerful? Please write if you have only a lead pencil and a scribbler, for I repeat that I look forward to receiving your letters. Remember me to Grace and everyone. I remain yours as ever, Gordon. At the end of the war, Gordon Morissette returned to Canada, completed his engineering degree at McGill, and married Marjorie in 1924. This is but one of over 40 letters sent by Gordon to Marjorie from between the years of 1916 to 1919. So on this Remembrance Day, above all else, we remember the sacrifice of our war veterans, past and present. We honor their commitment, 
their dedication to their country, and to the people in countries where they have been peacekeepers. They were and are people like you and me. They are our grandparents, our nieces and nephews, and our grandchildren. They are willing to give us the most precious gift of all, their very lives, for all for all for the protection of our own and the lives of those whom they have never met. That sacrificial gift borders on the love that Jesus has shown us. And just like the woman in our reading this morning with her two coins, whatever we can sacrifice to help others who are weak and vulnerable, no matter how small, that will be enough. On this Remembrance Day, I also remember what else the minister of that Kingston church told me. He said, whatever your perspective on war is, all of us should pause and reflect on what it means for those engaged in it. We can also remember that no matter how we struggle, in whatever circumstances, God is with us in our struggle. God walks on the battlefields, God walks around the gatherings of veterans all over the world this week, and God mourns with us in our losses. God is with us in our mourning, just as he is with those that we call our enemy. May our memories not fade of past sacrifices, and may our desire for peace in the future be our touchstone for the struggles in the present. Amen, and may it be so.
All of us have different gifts and different passions and different pursuits. But all of those are given to us from God for the building up of God's kingdom, for the offering of hope and newness and transformation in this world. And that can start in our families, in our community, our church, and beyond. So whatever you are thankful for today, whatever you want to offer up for the building up of God's kingdom, let us hold on to that for just a moment and then offer it up to God for God's spirit to work through. So let's just take a few moments of silence. Let us pray together. Just as the poppies of Flanders fields display life and beauty, may you, O God, bless what we offer back to you from our abundance. In that blessing, O Christ, may we scatter abroad in your name, become sources of new life and of beauty for an aching world, rooted in your peace which surpasses all understanding. Amen. Before we begin our communion service, I just, for some of you, you've probably, this has been a few times where you've used the little cups. And for some of you, it's probably brand new. They do, they have their own way about them, I'll just say that. There's, there's actually two um, barriers, two pieces of plastic to pull back. When you pull back the first one, that's where the little bread is. And when you pull it back again, that's how you get the juice out. But if you're having problems, or if you just muck up that one, that's okay. The ushers at the back, just put your hand up and they'll either bring some more napkins, which is fine, um, or, and or, they'll bring you another new cup, okay? So don't feel flustered. If it's just not working out, just put up your hand and, uh, and Brian or someone else will be able to come over and help you. So let us begin. In this sacrament, the ordinary things of life point to the sacred in the midst of life and beyond themselves to God and God's love. Visible signs of the grace of God. All are welcome in the name of Christ to share in this vision of creation healed and restored. All are invited as Christ's guests and friends to the table where none shall go hungry. This table, this open table, speaks of the shining promise of barriers broken and creation healed. Let us taste the mystery of God's love for us and be renewed in faith and in hope.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. We sing a song of thanksgiving, O oh God. Your first re- our first response to your providence is gratitude. We praise you, maker and source of all that is for this world of beauty and mystery, of living things diverse and interdependent, of complex patterns of growth and evolution of subatomic particles, particles and cosmic swirls. In the beginning, your spirit swept over the face of creation, animating all of energy and matter and moving in the human heart, creating, tending, and guiding all towards harmony with their source. We thank you for your loving action in all things. Through our ancestors and the faith, you show us faithful living. Upon their lives, our lives are built. You call us to be part of the communion of saints, experiencing the fulfillment of God's reign, even as we anticipate a new heaven and a new earth. And we find you made known in Jesus of Nazareth, so we sing of God the Christ, the Holy One embodied. We sing of Jesus, a Jew born to a woman in poverty in a time of social upheaval and political oppression. He knew human joy and sorrow. He healed the sick and fed the hungry. He forgave sin and freed those held captive by all powers of demonic powers. He crossed barriers of race, culture, class and gender. He preached and practiced unconditional love and he commanded his followers to love one another as he had loved them. Because his witness to love was threatening, those exercising power sought to silence him. On the eve of his torture and execution, he gathered with his friends. He took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you each time you do this, remember me. After the meal, he took a cup. And after giving thanks, passed to his friends saying, drink, this cup poured out for you is the promise of God. Whenever you drink it, remember me. In Jesus, O God, you make all things new. In his life, teaching and self-offering, you empower us to live in love. In his crucifixion, you take the sin of the world, grief, and suffering of this world. In his resurrection, you overcame death. Nothing separates us from your love. And so we say together, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so we sing of your spirit, faithful and untamable, creatively and redemptively active in the world, and in and through these gifts in this gathering. Thankful for all your loving action, we cannot keep from singing until all things have found wholeness and union in you. Holy God, holy mystery, holy love. Amen, amen, amen. Divine mystery who brings all life into being. 
We thank you for the witness and sacrifice of those around us. With joyful hearts, we sing your praise and offer thanksgiving for the witness and sacrifice of others who have gone before us. We praise you for their willingness to be instruments of peace in a hurting world. We praise you for the moments in our lives that speak of the great goodness that is incarnate in you. We praise you for the gift of life and for all life that is within creation. Restore in us a powerful love for life that is expressed in Christ, just one sign of love in a hurting world. Greater love, especially on this day of remembrance, we pray for those who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder syndrome. We pray for those who are wondering why they have survived all the violence that has surrounded them. Bring caregivers to those in need and people experienced in the arts of healing so those who seek renewal may be restored. Loving God, creative power, blessing your name, we seek your spirit. At this time, we also remember all those with whom you would have a share in your feast. We pray for all who are in sorrow or in pain. And we remember the family of Stuart Grant. All who are ill or alone, especially those recently diagnosed with cancer and those that support them. All who live with fear, oppression, or hunger. All whom the world counts as last and least. We pray for your church and its varied ministries. For the nations as they strive for peace and justice. For the earth and the fragile web of life that we all share. For those sitting in the pews around us, on our left and right. For our families and friends. Great God of all, as our prayer draws to an end, maybe we may we be reminded that our prayers are just a beginning. With your spirit ever active, with your promises ever leading us, we are aware that we too have an active role in bringing peace and respect to those around us. Come to us and bless these gifts of grape and grain. Make us one with Christ, light, life, hope, and love in the world. In this hope and as your people, we praise you, O God. Thank you, God, for your everlasting love that as disciples of Jesus, our work is always beginning. And so we gather these and all of our prayers, thankful that we may turn to you as to a mother brooding, brooding over us, as our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of life given for you. The cup of blessing poured out for you.
God's table is ready, let us eat the bread of life. blessing. Thanks be to God. peace of Christ be with you all. Let us greet one another with the peace, the love, and the hope of Christ. Please join me in the prayer that comes at the end of our communion service. We place our hope in you, O oh God. We sing of life beyond life and a future good beyond imagining, a new heaven and a new earth, the end of sorrow, pain, and tears, Christ's return and life with you, the making new of all things. We yearn for that coming of that future, O oh God. Until then, help us to embrace the present and embody hope, to love our enemies, to care for the earth, to choose life. Amen. Let us go trusting in God's never-ending care. Let us go seeking to be God's people. Let us go enfolded in praise and prayer. Let us go to be the, the, to be the people of peace, justice, and right relationship. Let us go forth with the blessing of the one known to us as our creator, our sustainer, and our glorious redeemer. And let the people say, Amen. Amen.